So there is this question that every child in the world has faced. And the question is, who do you want to be when you grow up? When I was five, I had the weirdest answer to that question. I would say an academy scientist, much to the dismay of people who expected to hear something like a policeman, a fireman, a football player, you know, the kind of things that normal five-year-old boys usually say. I was impressed with academy scientists, perhaps because I was fascinated with knowledge and learning. My parents taught me to read when I was three, probably to stop asking stupid questions all the time, or probably because there were no tablets and no Angry Birds back then. But whatever the reason, uh, by the time I was in school, I had already established such a strong link in my head between reading textbooks and professors that I just could not imagine learning happening otherwise. Now, let me ask you to close your eyes for just a second or two and think about learning. And also, let me guess what comes to mind. A library, a college room, probably some place full of books, probably a couple of laptops, maybe with Wikipedia and Google on. Maybe even some people with, you know, seriously looking with glasses, with hats, with academic togas, right? Or at least this is the kind of imagery that I had in my head whenever I was thinking about learning. So somebody can ask, why then did you come here to the American College of Sofia to talk to us about learning beyond academics? And the reason is that there is a very simple message that uh, I want to focus your attention on. And this message is that the time you spent in academia is just the beginning of your learning experience. It is the first few miles down the road rather than the journey itself. And if you wonder what is Super Mario doing on that screen, you will find out in just a minute. Uh, people believe that learning is usually confined to the walls of academic institutions. After all, your job description as students is to sit in classes, do assignments, and to absorb this great knowledge that is coming at you. And then, next stage, you graduate, you start as a junior employee, then you move up the career ladder, you end up as a big boss somewhere, and basically no more learning is supposed to take place during this stage. My view, however, is that you get some of your most interesting learning experience after you graduate. And very often this happens during some pretty ordinary circumstances. So please don't think that learning stops at college. And also one thing that I have as an advice is try not to plan your life too much in detail now. It is a good idea to have some plan where you want to be five years from now and roughly how to get there, but that's it. Don't get obsessed with planning. Don't worry too much if something takes a different turn than what you have expected. What is important is to identify the learning opportunities and to use them to advance from one stage of life to another. And in fact, life is not much unlike a computer game. You have your character, you move it left and right, you collect experience, and you gain levels. Only that the experience here does not come in the form of boxes and crates, and you don't have a counter when you open it. But talking about computer games, here are a couple of highlights from my own. 2002, I was a student in a master's program, and there I am. I was in a class where the assignment was to find a real-life consulting firm and do a project for them. So you can imagine all those top firms with the guys in corner offices, navy blue suits, you know, sitting there and getting an email from a random guy from a random London university saying, can I work for you? And them going like, what? So long story short, I might have been a good student, but the top firms were just not too interested in me at that point. So a friend of mine put me in touch with a small German firm, which had a couple of projects where they could use someone like me to dig some data and try to make some sense out of it. And the first such project was in a faraway country called Oman, where I worked in a fish factory. And in this particular factory, time seemed to have stopped because even though it was the 21st century already, these guys didn't have a single computer. And all the information was lying across the factory in the shape of lots of stacks of paper and notebooks. So if you needed an answer to something basic, let's say how much fish did we sell in Italy last year, then an accountant would sit, scribble for 
five hours something, and then if you're lucky, the answer will be somewhere close to reality. So my particular task was to get all this data from the notebooks and the paper to create a very simple database and to put the information there. It doesn't sound like something from which you learn a lot, but the thing is, it turned out to be enough to get me noticed during a job interview. My consulting career, unfortunately, didn't develop quite as I expected, so I had to find another job, and there I was, sending CVs left, right, and center, and in the meantime, Mercedes in Dubai were looking for a database expert. My experience in the fish factory taught me some basics, so basically I felt confident enough to put database programming on my CV, even though I didn't really have much clue about it, and during the interview, Mercedes realized that I'm the last person on earth who should be doing database programming for them. But nevertheless, they liked me enough to offer me a job at the company. And now, the reason I'm telling you what I did in my early 20s is not to brag about myself and certainly not to bore you to death, but to show you how some small and seemingly unrelated things can add together and give you just the right edge to move your computer character from one level to the next. The important thing is to identify those opportunities and to use them in the right moment. Now, to fast forward a couple of years, I was still in Dubai, but I figured out that an MBA would be the logical next step of my career, which in principle was a great idea, but I was a bit worried about competing against those Ivy League MBA applicants who I imagined would be some superhumans with Wall Street experience and with a dissertation with some scary topic like quantitative effects on the monetary supply increase, on the geopolitical situation in sub-Saharan Africa or something along those lines. However, it turned out that my own experience to that point was already much more valuable than I expected because while I was working in that fish factory and in Mercedes, I already had some practical insights about working in teams, about analyzing different processes, about managing tasks, and guess which are the qualities that the MBA admissions was looking for? Leadership potential, project management, analytical skills. So while I was copy-pasting things from one document to another and thinking how to tweak it just a little bit to make, it, to make the process better, the cumulative effect I got from this learning was enough to help me move to the next level of my computer game. And now if you're waiting for Super Mario, he's taking a break. Uh, my MBA program was an eye-opener about learning and about personal development because people often think that in such programs you have your stereotypical bankers and consultants with that scary dissertation topic which I mentioned. And in reality, yes, there were such people. At the same time, there were so many, so diverse background of doctors, military people, software engineers, you name it. And what was fascinating is that even though everybody had reached the classroom in a totally different way, everybody was completely different from everyone else, but still, they had all managed to learn the fundamental business concepts. You can learn about project management like me, organizing meetings of spare part dealers in the Middle East, or you can do it while you are with a team of doctors and nurses making a complex surgery. Now, to be honest, I prefer my own learning methods better, just because if you do something wrong, then at least somebody would not die, but this is a different story. And uh, talking about learning experiences, let me tell you how our first day in the MBA program started. We were put in groups of 15, 20 people, we were given assorted stationery and told to make paper cards and to sell it to the other teams. So you take a group of super motivated, super ambitious, super enthusiastic people and you put them through an exercise which is fit for seven-year-olds. Sounds a bit ridiculous, right? Also, there were no rules whatsoever. They didn't tell us who will be team leader. They didn't tell us who will be doing what. And this was the point of the exercise itself how to get around the egos of 20 people, each of whom believes that he is the most accomplished one and he is the one that should be leading the team and that the team should fight to the death if necessary so that they win against the other teams. The problem is that when you have 20 people, each one willing to lead and to motivate others, but none of them willing to be led and motivated, now this makes things a bit difficult. So you can imagine that by the middle of the day, we didn't have a single cart finished. 
And then we realized the point of the exercise. So we realized that the point is to make us work as a team and everything else comes next. So who says that cutting paper cannot teach you a valuable lesson? Or in fact, more than one lesson because Besides working in teams, we could also observe a few things about the development of leadership in a group of motivated individuals, about group dynamics and other things like that. And it is interesting that when you go through such an experience yourself, you remember the takeaways much better than if you just read about them in the textbooks. In fact, business books are full of experiments by some famous professors who have put together such groups of people and the takeaways were more or less the same as what we got while cutting paper and trying not to kill each other while doing so. But I'm sure that the memories in my head are much more vivid than if I had only read about it in a textbook. And another thing about learning is that it does not happen at predetermined moments. You know, you don't get this bright lamp appearing above your head or people sometimes imagine Archimedes in the bath or Newton with the apple falling on his head, but in reality, most of the learning happens during some pretty ordinary circumstances. And let me tell you a story about this company called Microfridge. It all happened in the early 80s, and the owner of the company figured out that college students eat a lot of microwave food, but the problem is that back then, the fridges and the microwaves were somewhat large, College rooms were very tiny. People were sharing facilities with everyone else on the floor, which was not very convenient. So what this guy did was to sit with a couple of engineers and to design a tiny unit, a microwave and a fridge in one unit. He found somebody who could produce it for him and started selling it out. Doesn't sound like a groundbreaking idea, right? Then this guy realized that students do not need uh, the device 24-7 because they move from one dorm to another. They also go home for the summer holidays. So besides selling it, they also started renting it out. Still, it doesn't sound like the greatest idea on earth. But let me tell you, this gentleman managed to sell the business a couple of years later for 70 or 80 million dollars, which in current money is probably three times as much. And they didn't teach him this idea in university. It didn't come out of a textbook. It came out as out of a pretty normal learning experience, watching the daily life of normal college students. So the moral of the story here is that no learning experience is to be underestimated. The important thing is to identify what's going on, to identify the opportunities, to connect the dots whenever possible, and to keep them in your head for the right moment. Which doesn't mean, of course, that you should be looking for some deep and profound learning in everything you do. Now, please don't look for such opportunities when you're washing the dishes and taking out the trash. But still, it is important to be open-minded and to be observant. Unfortunately, sometimes people just forget to listen or hear only what they say, and this does not help you to learn a lot. And now to build on that microfridge example, here are another few companies which started from small ideas and then ended up as household names. I'm starting with the sweetest one of all of them, which is Ben & Jerry's. These guys do, they produce some of the best ice cream on earth, but funnily enough, they started in 1978 with a $12,000 investment in some rundown uh, gas station in Vermont. Two guys, friends from school, completed a distance learning course in making ice cream. So can you imagine, distance learning course? And they had this idea that mixing the chunks with the ice cream would be nice, and we all see what happened. Similarly, Wrigley started in the late 19th century as a shop selling different stuff to people, and the owner was giving away a free chewing gum to everybody who bought a can of baking powder from them. And then a couple of years later, he just decided to start mixing his own flavor, and as they say, the rest is history. Then Mattel may be one of the biggest toy companies on earth, but it started in a small Californian garage in the mid-40s by three friends who were producing picture frames. And besides the picture frames, they also had a side business selling furniture for doll houses, so this is why they decided to focus on dolls. And then in 1959, they invented the Barbie doll. And last but not least, Walmart is a company that has two million people, but it also started as a family business. And their first store was built around the idea that you should have a smaller discount, a smaller commission than the competition, and to have larger volumes to have a bigger profit. 
So it's a simple idea, but based on this, they managed to grow into about 30 stores in the next five years or so, and then now they have close to 9,000. So this is so much for saying that you cannot learn from small ideas. And now I must congratulate you because you guys have been with me for about 17 or 18 minutes, and I told that until today the only people who could survive me speaking for that long are my parents, which is apparently not the case. To, to wrap it all up, there are just two things that I want you to remember out of my talk. The first is that learning certainly does not end in college, and that you can learn from everything as long as you keep an open mind. And the second is that you shouldn't be obsessed with planning your life, shouldn't be worried if something takes a different turn, rather you should use this as a learning opportunity. So thank you, enjoy what you're doing, and keep on learning. <laughs>